This podcast contains explicit language. This is Carlos. And this is Dave. David. <laughs> and this is Hardass, who is sick this afternoon. And this is Two Fat Guys Talk Games and Friends. We're, yeah, we're introducing we our friends. friends. Hello. We have a girl with us, Kiki. Say hello. Why, hello. And we have two fellows with us. Apollo, also known as Poe, my brother. Hello, Apollo. Hello, how's it going? Excellent. See, he knows how to talk. And Richard. Hello, world. How excellent. are we doing today? I'm doing fine, thanks for asking. That's excellent, that's excellent. Shut up for a second. All right, <laughs> today's topic, we are going to talk about RPGs, and Richard wanted to bring up the topic of East versus West. Now, I know that, what's it called, Extra Credits actually did a whole series on this recently. I haven't watched their series on it yet, but we can talk about East and West. Richard, you were saying something about how one of them used to dominate, and now the other does. Why don't you fill us in on that? Uh, I was just uh, bringing up the point that back in the days of the SNES, when the Japanese RPG was king of the line with most of the Square Enix titles, some of the earlier Tales of games... You know, Xenogears and the and the like. It, it was you know it was at the top of its game. You know, everybody was always wondering when's the next JRPG coming out. You know, nowadays we've got the Western market covering the RPG, covering more like an action kind of feel to it. With Fallout, Mass Effect games, you don't see much of the turn-based, damage, statistic-based RPGs that the, that the Japanese RPGs got. And now it's like, I see all these petitions going out to Japanese developers everywhere, like, oh, I'll keep bringing over these series. And oh, I'm just like, well, what what happened? What, where did the transition happen? Did we just grow out of it? Or, oh, okay. well, uh, um, I, I, there were RPGs back in the day that weren't Japanese, but they were all on PC, mostly, like Wizardry and whatnot. Oh, yeah, there were also uh, a few specific ones, you no know, different ones, that sort of break, broke the mold, too. Uh, the roguelike uh, series, where... Uh, it's a role-playing game, but uh, it doesn't follow a set uh, plot line. It just uh, everything it's, is It's kind of the central different. town hub with dungeons around it, yes? Something like that. A true roguelike doesn't have the same experience twice. It's like not even the same uh, dungeon progression and of the like. So that was what a few PC games were like at the time. Like, uh, like NetHack and Dwarf Fortress. Uh, I have I haven't touched those games, but I just uh, read about them. Didn't that originate in Japan, though, the roguelike? I thought they did. Because the first time I played a roguelike was Diablo, which is really very much one. Yeah, that roguelikes yeah, were definitely like before... They were, they were definitely before Diablo 1. What about something like Dungeons & Dragons and stuff? With, that's um, a tabletop. It's, even though that's a tabletop, that can fall under the concept of a roguelike, because... No scenario can be written out twice. Like, well, no mean, two Dungeon there... Masters are the same. I mean, like, wasn't there, like, a PC version of it, though? The thing about Dungeons & Dragons is it's a big franchise, right? Like, it was a tabletop franchise, and then they made a whole bunch of games based off it. And not every Dungeons & Dragons game or, fr or series or anything is even really based on Dungeons & Dragons. Like... There's Baldur's Gate, which Bioware released, which adhered closely to the rule set, but also added real-time kind of strategy to it a little bit. You could still pause to issue commands. But there were other Dungeons & Dragons games that were like almost brawlers or fighters. Uh, Capcom even released one for the arcades, where it was just a side-scrolling brawler where you could level up. It had no dice rolling or anything like that. It was just a hack-and-slash beat-em-up. And then there was, like, the Dungeons & Dragons cartoon, but that's kind of beyond the scope of two fat guys talking games. Just to give a history here, I mean, there is a reason why we call it a roguelike. 1980, the game called Rogue was the one that inspired the entire genre. That's why we call it roguelike. So this, 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 was, this was a game. It wasn't just that somebody just came up with the idea, oh, we're going to call this, this genre roguelike. It's roguelike because it's based off the game Rogue. Was Rogue Japanese or, or American? No, it, that was very much a Western game made for Unix. Yeah, that's right, because the whole tile set thing. Roguelikes are usually played in text. Actually, yeah. the, first ro the first Rogue game was a, almost a text-based map, but... 
depending on whether you're playing the ASCII version or the IBM Color PC one, I mean, it was very much your first ASCII graphic game. I'm learning so much already. I, I never knew any of these things. You totally learned from two fat guys talk games. Um, I'm just looking at the history here. There were two games before Rogue that sort of did the same thing, but definitely wasn't given the credit for Rogue. Roguelike. There was a game called Beneath Apple Manor in 1978, and then like Dungeon in, in 1978 as well. So there were games before it like it, but Rogue was definitely the first to pioneer the genre become popular and famous. And, and you're definitely right. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is on this list. Well, there, Dungeon Hack. There are some I, mean, I know they, very well, like like I As Your Dreams, Isaac. very much a roguelike. Time there are a couple in here that would actually surprise you that are considered roguelike. Go ahead. Chocobo Dungeon. Yep, that's a roguelike. Chocobo Dungeon 2 is your dreams, which me and, um, me and Wuss there have played greatly. Dark Cloud. I mean, oh. honestly, there's roguelike has been thrown around very heavily for, for years. Well, I always thought roguelike meant hub, dungeon surrounding hub, primarily dungeon crawl. That's what I always nope. thought roguelike meant. Oh, that, no, that, that's something different from, like, uh, Diablo 2 or Fantasy Star Online. But that, but no, that is what that those exactly games are. What it is? No, that's not what a roguelike is. A roguelike has, like, uh, randomized dungeons and nothing's, like, the same twice. So, At least so that's Diablo. What I think. Would you like the actual definition so we can move on? <laughs> yes. I suppose. Roguelike is a subgenre of the role-playing video game characterized by level randomization, permanent death, and turn-based movement. Most roguelikes feature ASCII graphics, with newer ones increasingly offering tile-based graphics. Typically dungeon crawls with monsters, items, and environmental features. Computer roguelikes usually employ the majority of the the keyboard to facilitate interaction with items in the environment. Yeah, Diablo. (laughs) Diablo, Finding of Isaac, that's a definite roguelike, despite it being a little like Zelda and Smash TV, you too. You know what else a roguelike? Diablo. That's totally what Diablo is. You could even play in hardcore mode, and your guy dies. And he doesn't come back. All right, actually, so, actually, Poe, yeah? Diablo is on this list. So is games like Sacred, Dungeon Siege 2, Titan Quest, Fantasy Star uh, Hellgate Online. London. I mean, anything with a randomized dungeon can be considered a roguelike. What about we don't Fantasy have Star to Online? shorten it down to, oh, it's got to be ascii or or old graphics, these games are all considered considered of the, the rogue genre. What about Fantasy Star Online? Is that on the list? It would have mm. to be. If it's it's just... a direct rip of like, Diablo 1 or 2. It should, it should be on there. Actually, it's not. It you, does. Uh, and, and, it would have randomized I'm... dungeons. Yeah, exactly. that's it. It should be on that list. It really is. If you, if you take out the randomized dungeons, it really is the same kind of game the the guys who did pso even took inspiration from diablo mm-hmm. okay okay but if i remember correctly pso didn't have randomized dungeons did it, it no. didn't play yeah, diablo in every street. other way it was diablo it, yes but, but the, the the key to roguelite elements is the randomization the ability to not go into the same area twice and do the exact same things that's what is at the heart of roguelike. These terms infuriate me because they don't fit my natu- my my set in my brain definition. Every game on this list has the randomized features and frankly, I, I agree with it. That is what makes a roguelike that genre. So we it is totally the randomization, the ability to play through a game twice and not do the exact same thing. Yeah, but eventually it's going to happen every uh, anyway because eventually you're going to run into the layout again. In fact, I think As Your Dreams only had 99 layouts. You'll find the same floor over and over eventually. But it is randomized. Well, then, this is true. Well, then, isn't that like PSO? Because for PSO, not to go back to it, but each ID has its own set of own set of floors and that are ram- randomized. But yeah, that's eventually, right. after you, you play them over and over again, you're going to hit each one eventually. I know it's not as, not as vast or as as many as there are for, like, other ones, but shouldn't that be considered it then? Yeah, because PSO was a lot like HeroQuest. Like, the maps were all static, but the start and end points and switches were randomized. So you did have varying paths. I, I, actually, I there, there are people arguing that it is a roguelike. 
<laughs> and they're arguing because we're doing this podcast. Uh, you know something? I, I think we should just turn this topic right around and let's talk rogue- roguelike games. Yeah, because we kind of veered off the West versus <laughs> Yeah, East yeah, like our original intention was totally versus West versus West versus East. East. And uh, we haven't even gotten there yet. <laughs> back to our you know, back to our scheduled program. So we're talking and about death, roguelikes okay. again? But but didn't we just talk about roguelikes? Didn't we already kind of fill it all in there? I feel I feel like we've hit every topic that needs to be hit. It's it's a matter of now comparing how that turned into the current day Western RPG and okay. comparing it to why Western I mean uh, Eastern RPGs just are so rare now. I'll tell you uh, why. I can, maybe I can put a little insight in that. Like, uh, one of the vanguards, if you will, for Western RPGs, BioWare. They do a lot of RPGs, but they get, well, most of the time, they get, like, acclaimed reviews for their games. So. Well, I mean, you. this can be argued. Back in the day, Final Fantasy used to get rave reviews, too, from critics. And that's, that's I guess, the pinnacle of JRPGs, I, I guess I have to say. I mean, it's mm-hmm. arguable, definitely, but this is what the general consensus would say. This was the JRPG. Yeah, yeah, but know. back then, Final Fantasy was actually well written and well made, and not what it is now. Indeed, Top- and other JRPGs would follow in that trend. That, that I think that should be the topic, and and more so, are there JRPGs still coming out today that don't deserve? the general consensus criticism that we give JRPGs now. I don't know whether this counts or not, but there's this one uh, Square Enix uh, either publish or develop game called Nier. It's like N-I-E-R. Yeah, I've played it. Yeah, Yeah, it's like the main character is different depending on which side of the ocean you are. If you're on the western end, the main character is like a grizzled middle-aged man who has to rescue his daughter from evil. But if it's the, in the Japanese version, it's a, you know, Bob Etsy style pretty boy emo teen who has to rescue his sister. I'll have you know, I did think that that game was pretty bad. <laughs> I, I, I think the thing like is, it. it was an experiment. I've yet to play it. I really do. I want to, though, because I hear some Actually, oddball I, things about it. I thought it was, as far as a JRPG goes... I thought it was the best thing they've done in years. It's definitely not the worst thing that Square Enix has, has published in recent memory. Definitely not the worst. I'll take it over Final Fantasy XII and thirteen and thirteen two any day. Or over... They did one for Xbox, and it's, uh, it's an infinite undiscovery. Yeah, forget that. That God, is a try game. Try it. See, I, I think really the, the problem between Western and Eastern games also comes down to what people are looking for in an RPG these days. If you do, if you look at what the Western developers are doing, Mass Effect, Dragon Age... I think Dragon Age comes the closest to the traditional Japanese RPG in that it was very turn-based-ish in how you could do, do the combat. The, the storylines, we are much more heavily based on the active storyline versus the, the Japanese... Let's throw out a whole bunch of weird shit and try and build a story around. I mean, they are having to fall back. They are so far out of ideas. They are going into the anime and, and into the really lame games and doing things like Trinity Universe. They're doing mashups between different universes because they have no ideas. And they think this shit is good. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I own Trinity Universe, for example, and. I actually I enjoyed the, the the combat to it, but my God, is this the idea of a storyline for them these days? See, it, I don't know. There's bad, that crossover. It's there's bad that. voice acting. It's just it's horrible. I'm not I don't sure. Know. There's that cross game where it's like Capcom, Nippon Ichi, and three other game developers that I don't even know where they came from. Same Trinity like, Universe, the sequel. That was a different uh, concept, too. One day. One day I'll get to chime in. One day. I, I don't right. think... I, I honestly don't think that either, like, either genre of RPG is really less active in terms of storytelling. It's just the, the Western RPG 
has been more about role playing. You get a character who is, for all intents and purposes, Chrono, and it is just the avatar for you. In fact, if Obsidian had remade Chrono Trigger like they expressed interest in doing a couple years back, that would be the perfect like that would be the perfect game for them to remake because. Chrono is already that guy. He can be tailored. You, you, like they would let you pick him as a default skin, make him a girl. You can make him look like whatever you wanted, have whatever weapon you wanted. He's basically the avatar for the player. And that's kind of what Western RPGs like to do. They like to give you an avatar for the player. That character in the universe is not really anything but your mouthpiece, and you get to answer questions and you get to branch out in the story depending on how in depth they program it whereas a lot of jrpgs are a canned story it's very linear and that's not bad either you know if it's in a compelling interesting story if it gives you enough ways to interact with that universe and still feel like you're playing a game nothing wrong with that final fantasy 6 did that very well mm-hmm. perhaps I the issue is that you know fine. i think there's room for both types of games it's just that the quality of the linear rpgs coming out of japan is uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they've always been like this, and I've just grown too old. But I don't think so, because I go back and I play six Final Fantasy six, or I go back and I play Chrono Trigger, or I go back and I play Secret of Mana, and I'm like, wow, why aren't they still making games like this? I think one portion has to do with the companies themselves. I've read an article before saying how it's whatever is working for them currently, they have to keep kind of doing, so they're kind of geared towards the only, Whatever the only option have. that they have. So they kind of like spit out over and over again until that method doesn't work anymore, which is why a lot of the current ones that we've been getting, it's kind of like, okay, same story, different faces, or same story, different sex, or something like that. I mean, you look at the, the Japanese RPGs still coming out. You look at any Tales game still coming out. You look at any... Any still Square Enix game that they're still making coming out, and you say, what is the overall consensus? I'm using that word a lot today. Of this, of this, of these stories, what is the one thing that they all have in common? And that is that you are a young boy and or girl that has a love interest that is going to meet said characters along the way on a path that it starts off as something small but ends up becoming owning the world or Saving the world, rather. And it always ends that way. There's never any micro storytelling. Like, I was about to use 8 as an example. I, I believe I've had several conversations with you. Uh, Final Fantasy 8, sorry. No, no. <laughs> Going a little fast. Yes, you thought. have, Richie. You yes, have I have. many combos. Um, I've had several conversations with Carlos here about Final Fantasy 8 as, a, as an overall piece. And overall, I like 8 the best out of the series just because of Squall alone. I think he's a very good character. But I've also agreed with Carlos on several points that 8 would have been a much better game if it didn't adhere to that Japanese role that everything has to turn into a battle to save the universe, which is what 8 did. It went from having a small-time war with another rival school country that turned into all-out war to becoming something about sources that came out of the witch way. Like, and the blood-red moon bleeds monsters on the yeah, earth. Yeah, like, what, like, where did this come from? This would have been a, such a better game without that. There was already enough storytelling capability in what you already had. If you fleshed out the rest of your cast, Squeenix or Squaresoft at the time, then you would have found that you had plenty of storytelling opportunities. But I they were I think you're touching on something that the JRPG is doing too much of. They, they overcomplicate what should be easy to tell, easy to make a game around stories. They need an Eldritch Abomination. They need to add something that wasn't necessary. That, but they think they're demographic once. They think they're Japan. Japan's demographic. They want, you know, these very effeminate man children who have to save a girl and kill Lavos. And that's the JRPG formula. You know, the first thing that came to mind was Tales of Vesperia. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. The first little bit you thought it was something different. It was a like they had a good topic of using okay. magic and technology versus not and the benefits of and disadvantages and stuff, and then that's exactly what happened. They threw in the 
and Telekea, and then they threw in that thing. I don't even know what it was called. Yeah. Yeah, I forget what it was called, but it was totally Lavos. It was like Sky Lavos. Yeah, and then they had to stop it, and it's just like, okay, well, it could have ended like 40 hours ago, but sure. I I find myself at that point with, with just about every JRPG that I play that's new, I'm saying to myself, I know that it's going to turn into this. I'm just interested to see and why, because a lot of these same JRPGs that we're talking about have legitimately interesting characters. Like, I thought Vesperia's cast was actually really, really good pre Antelikea arc, you know? Because then it just, it threw everyone's characters into, like, you know, it meshed character and plot to a point where it made some of the characters either overdone or not matter at yeah, all, man. Judith. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I totally agree with you. I thought Yuri was such a refreshing hero. He was he was a dude who kind of had it figured out, but he still had to grow. He knew who he was. He still had shit to learn. He was he kind of broke the mold of the JRPG hero in so many ways. He, he killed people. He killed people. I know he'd be he actually believably came to the conclusion that bad people should die. Now, this is in sharp contrast to another Tales hero Lloyd, who believed nobody should die and people should always be given another chance, and people should never try to kill themselves. Yuri had the complete opposite viewpoint, even on suicide, when he assisted that one guy to kill himself because he thought that was the honorable thing to do. And they made you believe that, even if you disagree with that. Yuri broke so many molds uh, in terms of what a main character could be, and he, he was just like Squall. He was begging to be in a better game. Because everything surrounding him started interesting and then turned trite. And that's what I feel about JRPGs these days. And I feel about that for a long time now, that that's what they're becoming. The good elements are kind of overshadowed by these bad ideas that earn executive clout for some reason because they think that'll make money. Uh-huh. And I think then... a lot of JRPGs suffer from Chrono Cro- Trigger Syndrome. Basically, it's not one person writing the stories, it's different chunks handed out. And you see that even in, in Vesperia. You got so far into it, and boom, what the hell just changed? Yeah, but the, to, the, to be fair, that can happen even with one guy writing the story, and multiple hands in the pot don't have to be bad if there's direction and guidance and not too many hands in the pot. Though don't I, I have definitely to, agree. but it has. I, I, I definitely agree that someone probably came in and it's like, you're telling a story about technology and magic and the dichotomy between nations? Fuck that noise. Let's destroy this bitch of a planet. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm trying to think of it, like, from the point of view is, like, we have all these JRPG characters that we love. Like, we each have different ones, some of us multiple of such. And then we think about it, and we think, okay, Western RPGs, in a lot of them, a lot of the successful ones, let's use the really successful ones, the Fallout series, the Mass Effect series. Uh, give, give me some more. Fallout, Mass Effect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you, 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 you are Dragon Age. Okay. Mm-hmm. And basically any bio. Oh, oh, oh a, 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 uh, Dragon Age. Dragon Age. You are the character. Even though in some cases you'll have a name. Dragon Age 2, you're Hawk. Even though you get to have a, a first name, you, you're still Hawk. Mass Effect, you're still Shepard. It gives you a name, but you're still you. You can still make said character in your likeness. Even then, even if you get a choice to choose between these choices, of, usually it's a good moral choice or a bad moral choice. In the, in the sense of Dragon Age, it's whatever it is you want it to be. There is no really Paragon or Renegade like Mass Effect's got. In Fallout, there's also no Renegade or Paragon meter to tell you, are you making the right choice? It's on you. But as a character, as you, is, I I would believe it's a very effective form of storytelling, letting the player choose his own character's, his or her own character's outcome. You know, like, what do we feel about that compared to having a story that is well done told to us about a character that we could relate to? I mean, I don't think there's any other character you could relate to better than yourself. You, you, you kind of touch on a point I, I, I want to bring up. It's a slight segue, but it's valid. Okay. Persona 4, JRPG, very Western-like in how it treated its main character. And maybe I'm the only person who's played this game, but Black Sigil on the DS 
was a Canadian-made RPG that was very much a love letter to the 16-bit JRPG with static, not static, with set characters and a linear story. And yet, you know, uh, Black Sigil had its faults, but it held my attention for some time. And Persona 4 held my attention for some time, and then eventually kind of dropped off and I became uninterested, although I did read about what happened in the ending. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is Persona 4 seemed to suffer what we're talking about in JRPGs a little bit. Like, so many cool characters, like like the, the insecure guy who secretly wanted things to be exciting, even if it meant bad things for the town, the guy who was secretly gay, the the chicks who may or may not have been lesbians. Great characters. But it, it became uninteresting. It's like after their first big revelation, they became background dating sim fodder. And I, I honestly felt that that was a game that kind of got ruined by it. it. It felt like it got bit by that Japan bug again, where they feel the need to kind of play up the stakes, just not where it counted, not where the characters could develop. But I go back to, say, Final Fantasy VI, and other than the big gap in storytelling and the world of Ruin, I don't feel like it was terribly, terribly faulty. I don't know, maybe, you know what? I'm fully accepting that this may be biased talking. It just... I want the next Final Fantasy VI out of that damn country, and they're not making it. What about Final Fantasy VII, since it's extremely similar to VI, though? So? There are things I like about VII. There really are. Like, I mean, I had the, a point I'm talking here. about the layout and how the story progressed. And obviously, it's just a cookie cutout of VI, carbon copy, whatever you want to call it. It did do things a little bit differently, but overall... You know, I will say this, to its credit... It gave you a much more hopeless scenario. It gave you a scenario where shit was not going to turn out okay, and not all the questions were going to be answered. And that is kind of turning things on its head. Sorry to interrupt. Please continue. No, no, no. Continue on. No, um, that was I was just, I was just going to say, since seven was so similar to six, it didn't exactly do this whole JRPG turnabout that we're talking about. I know for me, like, I'm, I'm not trying to be biased because I do like 6 better, but 7 kind of did the same thing where 6, where it's like, the ending didn't just flop on its side, where it's just like, oh, the big guy and they got saved the end or whatever. Do you know what I'm trying to get at here, or am I just kind of They, they not... kind of built in the threat from the beginning. Yes, exactly. That's what I was trying to get at. Time yeah. compression. Yeah, yeah, right? Oh, God, don't even get me started on this. Time compression. I love how when I was playing that game so many years ago, I never once questioned it. I was so in love with it. I mean, bias, I guess. First Final Fantasy game was 8. I'm not, I don't really think that I'm biased because I played Symphonia as my first Tales game, and then I played Abyss, Abyss afterward, and I ended up liking Abyss better, calling it my favorite. So I don't think that it was just by chance. I do really compare every other Final Fantasy I play to eights and say, like, okay, was this better? And ten comes extremely close, even though I agree that it is the better game in all intents and purposes. But a little off track. What I'm trying to get at is when I was playing eight, I was saying to myself, well, where did this come from? Why does this have to happen? Back when I was younger, I didn't question it once. But as I got older, I was just like, this just kind of came out of some some which way. You know, I was just like, this just kind of came out. I was just like... You, you mean time oh, God, compression? Here. Time compression, uh, I'm here. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> you know, I never questioned it. The first three playthroughs, I never questioned it. I'm like, oh, this flows together really well. Yeah, yeah, this is the part where like, time compressed, you know. And then, I, then I got smart. And then I looked at it, I was just like... Holy shit. How do you even write a summary of that? And then Ultimicia used an ancient spell to compress time into a <laughs> single point. And then oh. in the future, they beat her, even though time should have been compressed. I'm pretty sure that included a bunch of bottles of vodka. Indeed, that probably <laughs> And has. many, many seki. Like, I was just so flabbergasted. And then I was kind of flabbergasted first at the game, and then I was more flabbergasted at myself for saying, like, at one point, oh, this was great writing at the time. Like, I didn't know any better. Like, it's fun to play these games when you're younger and then go back when you're older and understand them. Like, I don't know. 
it was just fun going back when you're older to play Chrono Trigger or Super Mario and the Seven Stars or play these games that you thought you'd never touch again and just be like, oh, that's what they were really talking about. You know, Stuff I have like to tell that. you, every Final insight. Fantasy since seven did the did the time compression thing. Seven meteor weapons. Eight time compression. Nine. There's an entire other fucking planet. Ten. It's your dad. Eleven. It's your dad. <laughs> Twelve. <laughs> It, I love how we just it, it, stopped it's for a dad. second. It's your dad. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, that's another thing I wanted to start on. <laughs> like, uh, between the Western and Japanese RPGs, the difficulty. Uh, how difficult the games were at the time compared to now, compared to just how overall how it is. The thing about RPG difficulty is that it's all depending on how much you want to grind. Like, Fantasy Star 4 is pretty hard if you play it by its rules. And pretty easy if you just grind the shit out of it at the beginning. I'll remember that when I play it. Yes. <laughs> and then, meanwhile, I don't, I'm just going to bring this back. Uh, the Mega Ten series, uh, there's been a, you know, it's, it was always big in Japan, starting to get big over here on the west side. That game doesn't give a shit about uh, when it gets difficult. It's, you know, it's the kind of game that's challenging. I think it's like challenging. It's not frustrating challenging. But it actually provides a good, a good amount of difficulty. Whether it's like Nocturne, Strange Journey, Persona Three, I, I am still never going to finish Persona Three because yeah, of the I was, I was just about to mention, Paul. I was just like, I, uh, I was just hearing you talk. Oh, they're not frustrating, you know. They're they're not afraid to throw out the difficulty, but they're not frustrating. <laughs> Persona Three Final Boss. The PlayStation Persona Three version that. Well, that's one of the big. You know, that's one of the exceptions because the final boss had thirteen different forms. And that was <laughs> that was that was the first part of the boss. There's a second part. Know, that's no, completely... oh, that's just... Wait, 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 wait. That's okay, the okay, first la- part. Ladies, uh, I, I think we're looking past. If we want to go into difficulty, Star Ocean Two, I win. Shut up. <laughs> oh yes, we'll get to that one in a minute. So, twelve different final boss. Phases, and then it goes into a 13th form where it just utterly rips the crap out of you, all because you also, at the time, can't control your party members directly. You had to rely on their stupid AI to not fuck up. Yeah, that was that was a defining and miss feature of that. that game. I know that there's a remake, but I'm just not going to touch that one again. Yeah, yeah. Besides, Persona 4 was better than 3, in my opinion, about that. But anyway, yeah. Star Ocean 2, I heard about the infinite, uh, no, no, the limiter removal for Indolatio. Oh, poor Dave. And poor me. Uh, Even there, I mean, JRPG, I mean, they actually thought, and they said this with a, with a smile, let's go into Dark Souls. Oh, God. Fuck you. They registered the website, you will die. That their whole thing to this game was, we're going to make you cry. We're going to kill you. We're not going to be fair. We're going to make you grind out shit that you're going to have to keep on doing over and over again over an arbitrary bunch of crap. And this is considered good in Japan. Unfortunately, it's considered good out here as well. People like are thing. stupid. This is no, it, thing. It, it, I, I think it's okay. Tell your series, the uh, Agarest series. Yeah, that's that kind of shit too. Oh. Yeah, but that that game's not hard because it's hard. That game's hard because you need a strategy guide from the get go. At second twenty five, you must talk to this person. If you don't get to this place by second twenty six, you're fucked. Richie, that's like that one game you played, Harvest Moon. Oh yeah, the Harvest Moon games. You need a guide to play these games. They're legitimately no, you don't. games if you like the kind of game <laughs> that it is. Yeah, dude. I know. dude. You're say, you're saying Harvest Moon and Strategy Guide in the same same tone? I, I turn yeah. turn in your gate turn in your gamer's badge, get them off of here, get them gone. <laughs> oh please, give me a break. Come on. Down, if anyone the other ever a Harvest Moon game, you know that without some kind of notification, you the dates of which things happen when happen whenever. Only recently did Harvest Moon games start coming with like you know the villagers tell you of days when things are going to happen or this is going to happen or you get a sense of how much you're in hey. love with this person to get said event that happens here which you don't know where hey what okay, yeah, okay youngster i've been playing that since, since the first one 
I, I kind of want to know what Western farming sim we can compare this to. Nothing. You can't. It's a farming game. Exactly. Cabela's Deer Hunter. Oh. Hey, 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 hey. You know, the whole reason, what I was thinking about the whole time you guys were talking about these last couple of games were why, this is probably why Japanese uh, RPGs are, de- like, On the they're decline? coming, they would become unpopular and popular again and all that fun stuff, is because the difficulty and knowing exactly what to do when or the repetitiveness is probably... Uh, not as appealing to more people because nowadays more people are playing more games and a lot of people are like, well, I don't know what this is. Whereas back then when we were younger, when there was just RPGs, there wasn't as many gamers, maybe in closet gamers, sure, but I could just be totally wrong, but this is just me well, no, theorizing I, I think, here. But... I think you're on something there because back when we were kids, back when the, when the RPGs were good, Back in the days of the Super NES, the early PlayStation 1, we all had time to sit down, play games, and we just enjoyed what we were playing. Our palate has become a lot more refined over the years, and honestly, we don't have as much time as we used to. The online games are there, uh, action games are there. I would much rather these days play a game where I can sit at at my computer and play for 25 minutes put the controller down, come back six months from now, pick it up and not have to worry about, oh, well, I've forgotten in the last four hours of storyline, I'm fucked. I get that. I, I do wonder like, if a lot fuck. of the games we grew up with were actually bad. Like, they weren't well designed, but we played the fuck out of them. Did we mm-hmm. really need to grind out Sonic spells Knuckles. in Secret of Mana? No, not at all. But we Should didn't. that have been a mechanic? Should it really have been there? I don't think so. And scales too. Mm-hmm. I really get what Dave is saying. I mean, like, I think that's why games like Call of Duty and Gears of War have rose to such a popularity level, is that they are that kind of game that he describes. Is that a game that you can pick up and just be like, all right, let's do this. Like, I, I mean, that's the same reason I criticize it, especially Call of Duty, not so much Gears of War, is that well, it's pick up and play, point and shoot. But the thing about it, Gears it's so of War, appealing though. to people. The thing about Gears of War is that it's very well designed. The encounters yes. are actually very solid. The ammo and the situations they put you in are very thought out. You know, I make this comparison a lot. People laugh at it, but it's true. A, a lot of Gears of War, the encounter design kind of reminds me of like Mario and Mega Man games. The way they pace them out. The way they put things in certain ways that you have to react to elements you've seen before but not together. You know, it really is very well made. I really don't think it deserves to be lumped in the rest of the... With Call of Duty, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Call of Duty is like its own area. (laughs) Call of Duty falls into the categorization of American masturbation with the army. (laughs) (laughs) I'm totally okay with masturbatory army games as long as they're well-made, fun, and and compelling. Really, I just... I mean, Resistance actually had a storyline and kept me interested... Call of Duty hasn't been relevant since, you know, number two. Wait, no. That was back when it was called Modern Warfare. It was World War Two. The other problem with Call of Duty is that they force you to grind to just get basic functionality. It's no longer out pick, multiplayer, pick especially. Play. You have to grind out his gun skill, and it's nonsense. It's noise. You know what? Hold on. Wait a minute. That's true. I never really thought of it that way, but maybe this can incorporate into our RPG discussion here to get back on track. Call of Duty is pretty much the most played Western game on the face of the planet at this moment in time. Each game sells about, you know, 7 million to 8 million copies since Modern Warfare 4, uh, the original. So, with that being said, that you do have to grind to get basic functionality, and that that is one of the defining traits of a JRPG, then is it really just that, the story, that, you know, these stories can sometimes take up to like 50 to 60 hours long to complete, that that's the only reason they don't do this? If they're doing the same thing playing a Call of Duty game, and that some of these RPGs, like the Tales games, are still set in an action-based standard, so it's just like, you know, fast-paced, the combat is, you know, doesn't require too much thought process, it just requires, you know, execution and input, then what's the difference there? 
I think the grind the grind is two things. It makes you feel like you're progressively getting more powerful and it keeps you doing something in the game and adds like this layer of replay value. Whether it's artificial or not, that's that can be you can discuss that on your own time. Can I go back to Mega Ten for a second? Because uh, because standard uh, games in that uh, variety, uh, you can grind out your main character. Yes, uh, grinding only really benefits the main character. You feel him getting stronger. He's the only one who's going to be around because uh, it takes too long to powerfully grind the rest of your other monsters. That's why you go through the process of taking two monsters, using them, using them together to make a stronger monster. Who, yes, he's got these. Uh, good abilities, but you take that monster, get another one later, then fuse that one together to, to keep getting more and more powerful monsters, the more and more the you grow, you, know, you grow until you reach the highest level you can get to probably beat the game. I'm under the impression that that was intentional to erase the need for grinding in the first place. It's still a grind. It sounds like a grind to me. It is. Oh. Well, they did a good job covering it up. Because well, I never felt not, like I was grinding in, in, a, in a true Mega Ten game that's like not a spin off Persona or uh, Devil Summoner or whatever. No, I, I was really talking about like Strange Journey and Nocturne. Yeah, that's the ones I'm talking about too. Yeah. I, I gotta tell you, a lot, a lot of the reason I find some RPGs harder than I should is because I don't grind at them. Like when I was on disc two of Grandia 3 and I was only level 19. You got your ass kicked. I got my <laughs> ass handed to me until. And instead of grinding, I just got those gems, or whatever they were called, that made my characters attack like six times in a row, and I just stun-locked everything to death. And in Persona, I played through that whole game underleveled. <laughs> yeah, you did. Uh, you were at level, what, 30 by the time you got what's Naoto? Right, Naoto? And Naoto was like at 54 or something, and you're like, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm approximately <laughs> 20 levels below where I should be. And I was yeah. the skin of my teeth beating bosses. <laughs> that's and may awesome. Maybe that's another <laughs> thing. Like, um, I don't think I would have had as much fun at that game if I was leveling up according to its rules and just beating guys normally. I had a lot more fun since I didn't know whether I was going to survive this encounter that I was horribly underleveled for. Oh, that See? reminds me. It's, it's boring as fuck to grind through, like, any uh, Augurest War or what, no? The if you know, any time you went into a random battle on the map on the world map, it would take a day. It would take a turn. If you took longer than like 500 turns to grind out there, you wouldn't get. To, you would be locked out of the best ending ever. The, the ending see, that showed the most side boob in that stupid fucking game. Why did you no. play that on my Xbox? It will never be clean. <laughs> Don't worry. It's not, you, you, we were both there. It's not on your Xbox anymore. But I can't uninstall it from my brain. <laughs> but, uh, see, now with that, that's why I'm saying, I'm not trying to repeat myself or anything, but that's why I'm saying all those points that you've mentioned right now with the whole grinding and the whole, uh, you have to do a certain point, it's certain, like, you have, to, you have to do it so many times or whatever. That probably turns a lot of people off, which is why... Western RPGs have be have been becoming more popular. Yeah, for, uh, I just I just have another thing. Uh, the, the Western RPGs don't tend to do this often. They don't lock you out of a situation where you can't go back uh, and you and because you didn't take care of an event that uh, was uh, back in the environment where you were locked out of, you can't you can't get the you, either a character or. The re or prerequisite for the best ending. They sometimes uh, like every Ma Tales game ever. The, the, you know what? They um, sometimes do that. The very first Mass Effect did it. Mass well, Mass Effect as a series has done that. Dragon Age did that. And okay, we're, we're talking right, popular by, Western by, by, by Sonic games, so it, it's definitely not a just a Japanese or an Eastern JRPG mm -hmm. thing. I'm thinking we should all give our final thoughts on the topic. Okay. Sure. We must. If we must, we're having so much fun. Yes, <laughs> I was actually really getting into this. <laughs> okay, who, who wants to go first? I guess. Uh, I, I will give my final thoughts. When when you are dating a transvestite, don't tell your mistress because she will tell your wife. Final excellent. thoughts. Those are excellent words. Yes. yes. Uh, the other thing is, I don't care what country it comes from as long as it's fun. I just want some of the 
I just want some new versions of old games I loved to be made again. That is all. Too bad Seven's going to come before any of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one everyone wants. Richie, well, final thoughts? Well, uh, on a positive note, we may be getting a HD redo of Skies of Arcadia, so let's hope Sega has the balls to actually come through. <gasps> oh my god. I yep. knew you'd like that, wuss. I love that game. So good. <laughs> final um, thoughts, Poe? Uh, I'm good right now. Final thoughts, Richie? You know, girl for I life. really like... I, I really like both, you know? Western RPGs are great for different reasons than JRPGs are great. Richie and I love everything. being told a good story. So if, if it's a good story, I, I have generally thought that the Tales games are great stories, and I want to see more of them come here. Instead of them all hauled up in Japan in a form that I can't understand. I, I would love them to bring all the ones that they haven't brought over here. I genuinely thought that there were good stories and Telekea out, out of the way. <laughs> or more so that they just have good characters to them. And you know, that's, that's one of the things. JRPGs tend to have the characters, while the Western RPGs tend to have a little bit of both, the plot and the characters. But... I really love JRPG characters, especially the ones that I do anyway, the characters I see. I would, I want them both. I just want a world, a future where they could both exist. All right. Final thoughts, Kiki? My final thoughts are we should combine Western, Eastern, or, ha or have some sort of central country to do exactly what we just talked about. So Portugal. Me yep, there we go. Portugal will do some random... Sounds good uh, to me. Portugal is going to make Capcom versus Mass Effect. <laughs> no. <laughs> Portugal will have some I'll see random, um, they'll have some random, you know, ninja girls in the bathroom fighting off soap opera chicks, as well as telling a really good story and good gameplay. That's exactly how it's going to happen. That's excellent. All right. So I guess I'm going to stop recording soon. This is Two Fat Guys Talk Games and Friends signing off. Yay. Time compression. Yay. Time compression.